All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to review. Here's my email address in case you have other questions. I'll try and get to them. But this is a um, review of the honors optional review for honors chemistry. First thing, covalent bond. What is a covalent bond? Covalent bond, whenever you see the word covalent, think of sharing. You're sharing electrons. An ionic is a transfer. So when it asks you what a covalent bond is, it's an attraction between two atoms that is due to the sharing of electrons. So covalent is sharing. Ionic, if you see the word ionic, means it's going to be a transfer of electrons. Which pair of elements is most likely to form a covalent compound? There's a hot word. Covalent compounds are made of two nonmetals. So it's a nonmetal plus a nonmetal is covalent. So it can't have any metals in there. So you're looking for basically two nonmetals. So sodium and chlorine, sodium's a metal, cancel that. Barium is a metal, and that's a nonmetal, cancel that. If you look at C, C contains only nitrogen and oxygen, which are both nonmetals, therefore it is a covalent compound. Sodium is a metal. So when it asks you who's a covalent compound, the question's really asking you which are only nonmetals. How many electrons are in a single bond? Well, a single bond looks like that, which is two electrons. A double bond is going to be a total of four, and a triple bond is going to be a total of six. So two, four, six for that one. That's going to be number three. Uh, number four, what is a lone pair in the Lewis structure? A lone pair is represented by a unshared pair of electrons. That represents a lone pair of electrons. It's not shared. It's basically dots on the outside of an element is what you're looking for. Number five. Number five asks, what is this molecule? It's ICL. When we look at it, you have to decide whether it's polar, nonpolar, ionic. And the breakdown was, if it's above, I think it was nine, 1.99, you have to check your notes. Anything above there is going to be ionic, the electronegativity difference. Anything that's 0.41 to 1.99 means it's going to be polar covalent. So what you have to do is you have to take the values for each of them and subtract. So in this case, what you would do is you take the value for iodine, which is listed as 2.66 is iodine. You would take the value for Cl, which is listed at 3.16. Cl is 3.16 off your table. You just can subtract the two values. Obviously, the difference is less than 0.1. Uh, what you're going to get is, what is that, 34 plus, so it's going to be like 40, 0. 0.5 is going to be your value. So if it's 0. 0.5, the way it works is at 0. 0.5 difference, when you subtract always the larger from the smaller, when you get 0. 0.5 difference in electronegativity, you're going to end up with, in the polar region, remember, anything below 0. 0.4, 0. 0.40 or below is nonpolar, polar's here, ionic's here. So then for the answer for number five is going to be B, a polar molecule, partial negative charge on the Cl atom. Why the Cl? Because it's a higher electronegativity, which means the electrons will be closer in the bond, basically the chlorine, making it slightly negative and that's slightly positive. Okay? Next question. This is asking you, did I skip six? Whatever six is. Um, question six is not on here, but they ask you about here. Let me just do this. They ask you about a CF molecule. They ask you what is a CF molecule. If you draw a CF molecule, it looks like this. So this is question number six. If you draw this molecule, this molecule is nonpolar. How do we know it's nonpolar? Well, the two easiest ways to tell if a molecule is polar is first, does the molecule have a lone pair of electrons on the central atom? If it does, it's automatically polar. So no lone pairs on the central atom. No lone there. And are the outside atoms, if they're different, means the molecule is going to be asymmetrical, so it's going to be nonpolar, but these are all the same. So overall, the molecule, we're going to say, is nonpolar, right? So overall, this molecule is nonpolar, but it contains polar bonds. What does that mean? If you take F, which is an electronegativity of... 3.98 minus carbon, which is 2.55, what you're going to get is an electronegativity difference that's going to be polar, because 3.98 minus 2.55 is going to get you a difference of 1.43. That is definitely polar, but it's polar this way, it's 1.43 that way, 1.43 that way, and 1.43 that way. It's symmetrical on all sides. So if it doesn't have a lone pair of electrons, we'd say 
The answer on your review sheet is A, contains polar covalent bonds, because this is 1.3, 1.3, 1.43, 1.43, but overall is a nonpolar molecule. To tell if the bond is polar, you just subtract the two values from the table. To look at the overall molecule, you first look, are there dots on the central atom? No dots. Well, maybe it's not polar. Second check is if they're all the same atoms, same terminal atoms, it would be a nonpolar molecule. Next. Uh, I think I skipped over. Hold on. Uh, seven. When we look at seven, it says which combination of elements would likely form covalent bonds? So when you're talking about covalent bonds, what's happening is it's asking about nonmetals. Which of the following are giving nonmetals on the periodic table? Well, what do we know about nonmetals? Nonmetals tend to have a lot of valence electrons. Metals have very few, like if you look here, that only has one valence electron and two valence electrons. So those are likely going to be metals, except that this was hydrogen, but you really don't know, but you're going to assume based on what the information they're giving you. Those are metals. So anything with V and W, I'm automatically going to eliminate answer choice wise. And if you notice here, that has seven valence electrons and that has six. We know covalent compounds have usually, besides carbon, but are going to have five, six, or seven valence electrons, and that's how we spot that. If two Y could covalently bond together, what type of result would you get? Well, Y, if you look right there, you would get Y here, and you look at Y here. If you look at the two, you know they both have to get to eight. They both currently have six and six. So if you form one right there, they get to seven because they're sharing a pair. They have to share a second pair and then they would both get to eight. So when you go to try and find out what bond, everybody's going to try and get to eight, except if you're an exception to the rule. So in this case, the reason why that would form a double bond is you need to get to eight. If you have six, you basically need two more. You've got to borrow two. Those are the two you're borrowing from that Y, which means it's going to be in a double bond. Uh, let's see here. Number nine, covalently bonding, covalent bonding, covalently bonding, covalent bonding happens between which type of elements? Covalent bonding is going to be between nonmetals only because that's basically the only ones that bond. Structural drawing that indicates how F2 bonds. How does F2 bond? Well, if you look, F and F, they're both halogens. What's going to happen is a halogen is going to have seven electrons. It only needs one more to share. So it just forms a single bond like that molecule right there. So ultimately, it will form a single bond because if you think fluorine is seven plus seven, it has a total of 14 valence electrons to share. I just used two right here in one, a single bond because I do a skeleton structure. 14 minus 2 is 12. This needs 6 and 6, so it's going to be equal to 0 overall. 0 overall means all single bonds, so it's going to have a single bond, and that is going to be your drawing right there. Electron dot diagram that shows the bonding in uh, N, H2, N2. So if we go to do this molecule... H can't be your central atom, so I'm going to go N, line, N, line, H, line, H. Using the same method, basically hydrogen has one each, so one plus one plus nitrogen is five plus five is a total of 12 valence electrons, right? I just used two, four, six. 12 minus six means I have six remaining. Well, hydrogen never needs any more. It just gets a line. Nitrogen, the way it's drawn, has two and four, so it needs four more. This nitrogen has two and four, it needs four more. Four plus four is going to be eight. So what's going to happen is six uh, minus eight is going to be negative two is always equal to one double bond. It has to go there. The last step is check to make sure everyone has eight. Hydrogen's good. This point now, nitrogen has, if you think about it like this, two, four, six, so it needs seven, eight. Two, four, six, seven, eight. So that would be the molecule that you would end up with. It has a double bond in between, a uh, lone pair of electrons on each nitrogen. So ultimately, you're going to end up with the structure you see right here. G. Next. Twelve. The structural formula for a nitrate ion. Nitri or nitrite ion is N is going to be five valence electrons plus six plus six plus one. So I'm going to get 18 valence electrons right there, right? So I'm going to go N, line O, line O. I just use 2 and 4. So I do 18 minus 4 is going to be 14 remaining. If I check my needed, this is going to need 6 and 6 on the outside. That's supposed to be a single line right there. 
Six and six, I just checked the inside one. That's got two, four, so I need four more to get to eight. Six plus four plus six is going to be 16. 14 minus 16 is going to be negative two. That means I get one double bond. Well, where am I going to put the double bond? You can put it either place. It's called a resonance structure. So in this case, I'm going to put the double bond on this side. Then I just add the dots to get to eight. This needs one, two, three, four. This needs one, two, three, four, five, six. This uh, so far has two, four, and six. I had two more. That is actually going to be a polar molecule because it has a lone pair of electrons. It's also going to be bent. When you draw this geometrically, you would put brackets around it, but it would be bent because the species formula is going to be A for the central atom, and it has two terminal atoms, which is going to be X2, and a lone pair of electrons is E, so your that would be a bent molecule. And the correct Lewis structure for that is going to be on here is going to be D. That's the correct one. 13, the BF bond is what for electronegativity purposes? Well, you subtract the larger electronegativity from the smaller electronegativity. So I'm subtracting 4.0 minus 2.04. I'm going to end up with 1.96. And remember the borderline. 1.99 is the border between ionic and polar covalent. So in this case, I would say that molecule would be polar, or that bond actually, sorry, would be polar covalent. 14, which of these bonds between is not nonpolar covalent? Well, remember, if it's diatomic, it has to be basically zero, nonpolar. Because if you have two, they have the same electronegativity, which means the electrons are evenly shared. No, no, and no. If the atoms are different, then you have to check. You would subtract H from Cl, but by process of elimination, it's pretty easy. Multiple covalent bonds can occur in atoms that contain carbon, hydrogen, or carbon, nitrogen, or oxygen. Those are the ones that uh, covalently bond. Hydrogen is an end cap. Chlorine is a halogen. So halogens do not form double bonds. They're an end cap. Uh, the substance used Lewis structure shows three covalent bonds. So like if you go to draw these Lewis structures right here, if you don't know by now, water, I mean water when you draw it pretty much looks like this. You should have a feel for it from bio like that. It's going to be bent because it's AX2E2, which is a bent molecule. Um, if you look right here, NH3, which is a famous one, you go to draw it. I do this. Let's say I start with 5 plus 3. I have a total of 8 valence electrons. I just use 2, 4, 6. 8 minus 6 is going to be um, 2 left over. And I, when I go to do need it, this needs 0, 0, and 0. This needs 2. That tells me all single bonds. And it tells me that would be my structure. And that would be the one that also contains three covalent bonds. Uh, next one, how many double bonds are there in HF? Well, if we remember, we, H can only connect with a line. And then, you know, a halogen needs eight valence electrons. Hydrogen does not. So there would be zero double bonds in HF. How many extra electrons are there in the Lewis structure of the polyatomic ion PO4 3 minus? That would be, well, when you do the math, the electrons, what they're asking is how many electrons you add. It would be negative three. How many electrons must be shown in the Lewis structure of the polyatomic ion OH? When you go to do OH, you go to it, oxygen is 6, hydrogen is 1, and then the negative. So boom, it's always got to be an even number at this point. So there's 8 valence electrons. So when you show the electrons in the Lewis structure, it has to equal the total at the beginning. So your total is going to be 8 or C. What is the Lewis structure for HCl? Well, you take H, single bonds, has a single bond to Cl. Cl is a halogen. You've got to add the dots to it. You're basically going to end up with that. We know that H doesn't. If you look there, H gets dots. Never, never, never. So you pretty much automatically know it's going to be D right there. Next one, 21. Which of the following is a polar covalent bond? So a polar covalent bond, basically, if you look right here, it's SI and SI. That's going to be zero, the difference right there. If you look right here, this is a metal and a non-metal, and that's a metal and a non-metal, which technically are ionic bonds. You pretty much can skip the calculations for those. Could, could check it, but it's a metal and a non-metal, metal and a non-metal, which are considered ionic. When you look at PCL, go ahead and look it up on your sheet. You do the calculation. That should end up as a polar covalent bond. This is asking who is the greatest polarity. That would be the greatest difference. Obviously, that would be zero because they're the same. You would look up sulfur, so when I go to look up sulfur, 
Sulfur would be 2.58. Oxygen would be 3.44. You'd subtract that. Carbon is 2.55. Phosphorus is 2.19. And finally, boron is 2.04. And oxygen is 3.44. You're looking for the greatest difference. That automatically, when you do the math, that's going to have the greatest difference. The number of lone pairs in the N2 molecule. Well, nitrogen has five valence electrons. There's two of them, which is 10 valence electrons. So I go nitrogen, dot, dot. I do a single bond first, so I just use two electrons. I have eight left. When I go to do needed, if it's outside, it's always going to be six and six, unless it's hydrogen. Six plus six is 12. Eight minus 12 is going to be negative four. Negative four can either be two double bonds or one triple. Well, what makes the most sense here is a triple bond. Then I just rock the dots to get to eight, dot, 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 dot. So when I look and it asks me number of lone electron pairs, one pair there, two pairs there, B is the correct answer for 23. 25, which of the following compounds, I think that should say, does not follow the octet rule? There are four weirdos that you're supposed to be aware of. The weirdos on the periodic table are going to be boron, which only bonds on three sides, beryllium, which only bonds on two, uh, phosphorus, which can, which can bond and hold sometimes, can have 10. It's possible to have 10. And then sulfur can have 12. This only gets four. This only gets six. So when it asks you an exception to the octet rule, you're looking for the weirdos. Bing, bing, bing. I see a weirdo right there. Which of the following molecules has an atom with an incomplete octet? Again, you're looking for a weirdo. I see the weirdo right there. According to the Vesper theory, the structure of ammonia molecule is what? So they're asking you the geometry. So when you go to do it, five for nitrogen, one for each hydrogen. So I get a total of eight. I put an N in the middle, line H, line H, line H. I just use six. I have two remaining. Then I go to find needed. Zero, zero, zero for hydrogen. This needs two to get to eight. It's got two, four, six. Two minus two is zero. Rock the dots. When I look at that formula, it's AX3E. Because so he's got a lone pair. One, two, three atoms connected. That's the X and the E. That is going to be a pyramidal structure. He's got a polar molecule. That molecule is polar because it has a lone pair of electrons in the central atom. It is also a pyramid. I believe that's the end of the, oh no. Uh, predict the shape of uh, CI4. I'm going to go to predict the shape of that. Let's see here. I have to draw it. All right, so when you go to just figure out the shape of something, you got to draw the sucker first, right? So when you go to draw it, you do this. Go back over here. Uh, CI4. So carbon has 4. I has 7 plus 7 plus 7 plus 7. You're going to have 32. You start with 32 electrons, right? So you start with 32. I'm going to put carbon in the middle. And I'm going to go line I, line I, line I, line I. So then what you're going to do at that point is you subtract. You used eight electrons. So I have a total of 24 remaining electrons. Then I need it. Remember, the outside's always, you can always need six. So six plus six plus six plus six is 24. Carbon has two, four, six, eight. So when I go ahead and um, I subtract uh, eight, wait, see, oh, wait, carbon has eight. So I have six, 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 and six is 24. That's going to be equal to zero. So that means all single bonds. So the last step I have to do is basically. So then ultimately, when you go to do the geometry of this, it's A, X, four, because it's one, two, obviously you have to add the dots here, so you'd add six dots here. And then you're supposed to memorize at that point, AX4 is a tetrahedron. So the shape of this would be E, tetrahedron for 28. 29, predict the shape of CLO3 minus. So when you go and draw that, ultimately you should at this point be able to draw it. So ultimately you would see this, you would go and see CL, line O, line O, line O. I'm guessing based on that, it's got to be 7 plus 6, 6, and 6 plus 1 is going to be what? 18, 26, 
minus 6 is 20. Okay, so that's going to be all. It's 26 minus 6 is going to be 20. 6, 6, and 6 here. So it's going to be... So you get that. And then basically if you look, you want to bracket it. Oops, that's not a pen. Bracket it. Write the charge on the outside. It's going to be AX3E. Which the shape of that is going to be a pyramid shape. The polar because of lone pairs of electrons. So it's asymmetrical. So if you look right here, that's going to be a pyramid. H2SC, when you look at H2SC, look at it. It's going to be S, E, H, and H. Just similar to water. It's got six valence electrons with two H's. You're going to get that. That's the species form. It's going to be AX2, E2, which is going to be a Beck molecule. So that molecule would be Beck. SiO2, when we go to dry SiO2, SiO2, Si is 4 plus 6 plus 6 is going to be 16 valence electrons. I go Si, line O, line O is going to be minus 4. You get 12 left over. If you need 6, 6 and 4 is 16. So it's going to be negative 4. So when you go, you either add two doubles or one triple. In this case, trying to keep it symmetrical, you add two doubles. And then what you would do is add the electrons that you need. So in that case, you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. And there is your molecule right there. The species form is going to be AX2. D nothing because there's no lone pairs on there. So it's not a polar molecule because it doesn't have dots. And the terminal atoms or the outside atoms are the same. So it's AX2, which makes that sucker linear. Falling molecules contains contain falling molecules contain polar bonds the only mo nonpolar molecule is what so when you look at it if it's only two elements and they're different it's going to be polar so that's polar when you know water I mean at this point you should already know what water is from bio and we've drawn it about a hundred times so that molecule is going to be polar because of lone pairs of electrons right it's automatically going to be a polar molecule NH3 is always a polar molecule CO2, why is CO2 nonpolar? Well, when you draw it, CO2 is going to be nonpolar because no dots on the central atom, no lone pairs, and the terminal atoms are the same. So you have a nonpolar molecule. Hopefully, this helps with your review. Have a good night.